Hello, and welcome to episode number 65 of the Rose Bros podcast. Today we are joined by Adi Rao, co-founder of Cappy, a profitable remote team management and productivity software tool that Adi has bootstrapped with his co-founder right from the start. After experiencing the pressures and pitfalls of the venture capital-backed startup model, Adi decided he wanted to try a different business approach that allowed him to remain profitable and still have time for activities outside of business. After self-teaching himself to code at the age of 30, Addy's article on the process went viral in Hacker News this spring, catching the eye of many who envied the process. So far, Addy has managed to achieve his goals as Cappy continues to grow and remain profitable, all the while leaving him time to slowly work on the business as well as other ideas. We sat down for a smooth cup of Rose Bros coffee and talked about the process of self-learning to code, bootstrapping a software business to profitability, assets that earn while you sleep, the value of the long-term view, and a lot more. Also, if you enjoyed the episode, check out rosebros.ca slash podcast, where you can make a small contribution to support the show. Any support is much appreciated. Enjoy. Addy, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Trevor. I'm I'm super excited. Let's do it. You are the CEO of Cappy, I believe it is. What is that and how did that yeah. come to be? So Cappy was the name of my dog two, three year, years ago, who unfortunately died. But the I mean the interesting part for you might be that she was named after uh, coffee. So Kapi is uh, coffee uh, ka- coffee in South India. That's a slang word that people use for coffee. Very cool. Um, and that's where the name comes from. We've been around for a year now. We just started. It's a software company. What does the company do and what services does it provide? Let me, let me give you a very simple use case. Imagine you are a remote manager or the CEO of a company that runs remotely or has distributed offices. You can use us to build happy, high-performing remote teams. So we do that in three ways. One, you can get feedback from your team. You know, how are you feeling? How are your energy levels? We send out these surveys to your team and, you know, get you feedback and send you these reports that you can use to, you know, to see how your team is doing and, you know, uh, feedback from them. The second thing you can do is you can do stand-up meetings. So imagine a really simple, a synchronous way of doing remote meetings. So, you know, in the morning, everyone will get a check-in, which will say, what are you working on? What are your plans? Do you need any help? And the bot will go collect all this status reports from everyone. Just keep everyone in the loop and, you know, anyone can see who's blocked and get involved instead of having to doing, you know, like jump on another Zoom call. And the third one that you can do is, uh, it's one of our new features, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it's called Icebreakers. So imagine you're working in the morning or in the afternoon and you get a question from the bot which says, hey, are you a coffee person or a tea person? Or, you know, the next week the question will be, which Avenger character are you? Are you Spider-Man or, you know, are you uh, whatever, Thor? And the answers to these questions are posted publicly to everyone and now everyone can get, can get involved, right? So if these are, think of these as spontaneous, serendipitous conversations you might have in an office, right? Hmm. Like you bump into somebody and you start talking about the weather. That's what these questions do. So these are icebreaker questions that our tool will send out to the team. That's what we do. Doing these three things means that teams are more aligned with each other, you know, they're more happy uh, and they trust each other more, right? And that's the goal. In a nutshell, it's remote workplace management. Yes, uh, I would I would put it a little bit more niche into the remote leadership category we don't want to get into payroll we don't want to get into you know time off or pay slips and stuff like that we want to strictly build a toolkit for a leader it's going pretty well also you guys are profitable i think i read you're doing about a thousand dollars a month in revenue right now yeah i mean i'm pretty happy with the way things are going but there are more there are different ways to look at this right thousand dollars per month isn't much especially if you are you know two co-founders who are both married now but the good part is that i mean since it's a software is that we don't have any cost like we possibly spend maybe five to ten dollars on our expenses That's the cool. rest is everything is in the pocket and the other part is that i mean i do work on copy but today if for the next two three months i stop working on copy 
it's not as if anything will break because everything is automated mm. it's, you know the, it's a software it just keeps going people sign up some people might churn out but you know i don't think a revenue will go down from $1000 to zero in 3 months right mm-hmm. so i'm very happy with that it's giving me a lifestyle that i am really really liking until now i've been part of really fast growing chaotic vc funded companies like i was a ceo at a at a startup that raised 5 million dollars from like some top silicon valley startups 250 employees were reporting to me it was crazy it was good but i don't think i want to do that anymore i'm pretty happy with making less but earning more time out of it does it make sense <laughs> absolutely i think that's one of the things that i thought was cool about you and the story of the company and what i was going to also touch on is what's interesting mm-hmm. is your story I originally read about you in Hacker News. And so what was cool is that you self-taught yourself how to code and you were mm-hmm. 30 at the time. Yeah. So the why behind it is is a, is a long story, but I'll try to, uh, I mean, I'll try to make it concise. I've always been in the tech industry, right? I've always been in tech startups. Uh, I am a mechanical engineer. A lot of my friends were into software engineering. I got into the tech industry in India right after graduation and i was always a product manager slash business person mm-hmm. so i kind of new technology i knew what a database is i knew what an android app is but i could never really talk the language of the engineers mm-hmm. and that's not a problem if you have raised funds right you can hire amazing engineers or you can you know have a great cto etc but considering the path we wanted to take now me and my co-founder that hey you know let's just keep a really really small lean team mm-hmm. i i wanted to make, and I, actually at that time 2 years ago i'm 32 now i started to learn code at 30 my co-founder hadn't even come in like we were just friends at that time mm-hmm. so i knew that i can't hire anyone so i have to do it on my own so i just kind of got into it so the why is you know the reason is that i wanted to at least have the ability to ship out things on my own right like just have the simplest thing go out mm-hmm. because i've always believed that if you can at least get validation on your own then the next steps become easy you know like you can you can excite an engineer and say that hey look i already have a thing it's making 100 dollars a month come join me and we'll take it to the next level mm-hmm. so that's why that's why i did it and that was 2 years ago that's cool because i think a lot of people think maybe when they get to their 30s or at least the perception is that maybe it's too late to learn how to code. But in reality, it's mm-hmm. something you can pick up pretty much if you have the yeah. effort and the time and the willingness, you can pick it up whenever you want. For sure. It's like any other skill, right? I think there's been a little bit of taboo around it that, oh, no, it's, you know, it's like rocket science, only smart, you know, like mathematical oriented people can do it. Uh, that's all bullshit, man. <laughs> at the end of it is just really simple it requires patience and the thing with coding is that if you can break a problem into smaller sets you can learn how to code right so you will never learn how to make an app on day one but what you have to do is break it down right like you need a sign up page okay what is a sign up users come and you know give their profile where does that profile go it goes into a database so you learn about databases okay how do you insert something into a database you take a week to learn it how do you read something from a database you take another two days to learn it how do you put a button here so as long as you keep breaking it down into smaller steps it's all easy honestly and all engineers all they do is just go to stack overflow and copy paste code from there and do it <laughs> like i do it every engineer does it what were the best resources you used to learn how to code I, I remember I remember signing up for a few courses. Uh, there was there there was another uh, he's he's a Canadian too. I think this guy called Wes Boss, W E S P O S. He's like a JavaScript course guy. And he's pretty popular in the JavaScript uh, language uh, ecosystem. So I took a course from him. I took another trial course at this company called Udacity. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is like a whole nano degree this thing but honestly i didn't really complete any of those because mm-hmm. there were a lot around you know learn this theory or yeah you know so i just couldn't there's because there's nothing to implement it like the, i finally learned it when i said i want to make this website for sure and then i then i sketched some wireframes and i started reaching out to my friends that okay how do i you know put the button here or when i click on this i want this to happen how mm-hmm. do i do that So that's how it happened. 
how long do you think it took you to get pretty good at writing your own programs? I don't think I'm still very good. I'm probably <laughs> a fresher. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really got confidence, I think, after two, three months. And this is, I was doing it night, weekends. But I think after doing two, three months of this, you kind of, I think there's this time when, uh, there's a fantastic book by this guy called James Clear, Atomic Habits. Mm-hmm. So he talks about this thing called shift in identity, right? Once you keep doing something, there comes a day when you suddenly get up in the morning and you realize, oh shit, I am a programmer. Yeah. You don't think anymore that this is something I have to struggle through. It just comes to you. Mm-hmm. And that just comes with like daily consistency. I, so it happened to me, I think maybe three months, four months, maybe. Where'd you start? HTML, CSS, JavaScript? I think it was all together. I was doing JavaScript for the front end stuff where I was trying to click this button and this should happen. Mm-hmm. And then I was doing the back end uh, for on Python. But I think the the progression might have been JavaScript and then Python because just the front end stuff is a little bit more, the feedback loop is a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's a little bit more, how do I put it? It's a little bit more earlier in the product uh, workflow, right? Like mm-hmm. you have a design, you use JavaScript to make it interactive, to store it into a database and make it do things is where Python comes in. So that's like a later step. So I'm pretty sure maybe JS would have been earlier, mm-hmm. but I don't remember it being like a step-by-step journey for me. It all kind of comes together, I guess, when you're trying to make something on your own, you have to take little bits of each language and put it together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of dependent was, I mean, I got lucky that I had an ecosystem of friends who I could reach out to. Mm -hmm. So as a product manager, I knew a lot of good engineers. So I could just, like, I used to buzz them on WhatsApp, on email and say, hey, this is my problem. How Mm -hmm. do I fix it? Do you think it's important to learn how to code nowadays with all of the low code, no code options available? (laughs) (laughs) This is definitely a very touchy topic. I'll give you my extreme view. If I have to put a statement out there, I think everyone should learn how to code. I think everyone should. It's like knowing how to bargain. It's like knowing how to sell. It's like knowing how to write. Everyone should be able to do that. But the core philosophy, I think, which is important is that everyone should learn how to automate things. Like human beings are not meant to keep doing repetitive things, right? Just know how to automate things which are boring, which you don't want to do or which you are repeating yourself just learn how to do that if you if it's no code it's fine but you know just kind of learn those things so i think i would i would put that as a generic answer but i think code is important yes it's not the full answer just because you know how to code doesn't mean you'll become successful but it helps i mean it allows you to understand what's going on behind the scenes a little bit more so that maybe if you do have an idea, you might know how to build it or at least know who to ask, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. It seems like you get extreme views. I read your blog post on how everyone should learn how to code and it sounds like there may have been some pushback on that. <laughs> a lot, a lot. Really? Why somebody push back on that? I mean, I, I think the pushback comes from two places, right? One is the the holier-than-thou software engineers who who I feel think of themselves as part of the inner circle hmm. and they don't want, you know, they don't want the masses to come into it, right? Really? I, I got the feeling like that. I definitely think there are people like that. It's, it's a it's a thing of being attacked, right? Like, oh, I went, to a co- I went to a college, I spent so much money, I for four years I studied this and now here's this idiot who's saying that, you know, I could build an app in two months, right? Hmm. So I do think that that slight this thing exists in the community. That's one for sure. And the second thing is comes from non-business people who feel that, hey, you know, here is someone who's saying that this is a prerequisite to finding success. Hmm. You know, I don't want to learn to code. I can just hire people. Look, I have been successful without code. Look at so many people who have been successful without code. You, hence, you shouldn't learn how to code. So I think these were the two the two possible categories of people who kind of gave pushback on that. It is nuanced. Like the blog title is definitely a little clickbait. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's definitely some nuance to it. But if you tell me to, you know, just put myself in one camp, my camp is that everyone should learn how to code. Mm-hmm. It's super important. Well, I think a lot of people will say that when you put yourself through that learning 
process you also forces you to sharpen your thinking maybe think in a systems kind of way and maybe it uh, helps you to think clear in some ways too yeah i think uh, system thinking surely helps and as i was saying right system thinking is that like you have this huge problem next to you you can't break it down today mm-hmm. i mean you can't achieve it today how do you break it down into a bunch of three four systems right like the one system automatically is javascript and python you make the user interact on using javascript you push something into your app use python to do something now there are two parallel systems just because something breaks on the python side doesn't mean that something has to break on the javascript mm-hmm. side so you already have systems so it definitely helps um, and i think just putting yourself through this space of of learning something new doesn't matter if you're 30 or 40 i actually feel now for me learning itself has become a skill mm-hmm. for right? sure so like I, i picked up i picked up ukulele when i turned 31 <laughs> yeah it's a it's a very simple instrument like i'm not i'm not uh, jimi hendrix or whatever but yeah. you know i can play a few songs now and have fun and it is the same concept i can't play a song on day 1 but i have to break it down i have to first learn mm-hmm. okay you know what are these scales what are chords then i have to first do a single chord song happy birthday you know mm-hmm. then i have to do two chord song then i have to go down the fret so mm-hmm. it's it's this i think learning something new is definitely opens you up to critical thinking you know solving yeah. problems it's i think super important were you always interested in software and coding and tech or did you kind of just fall into it or is it what kind of attracted you to the industry good question i think i've been in the industry in some way or the other mm-hmm. i've kind of been drawn to it even so my first job was a mechanical engineering job uh, i was working at the mercedes benz r&d center in india i was one of the many people like who will do autocad and you know like look at a nut and a bolt and try to do some figure out the best design for it you know do some stress tests on it and whatever mm-hmm. usual mechanical engineering stuff which i was not very good at <laughs> um i i quit that in two months and then i started a social media agency with one of my friends okay where i picked up like content writing social media marketing just digital media and stuff like that i don't really know what made me do it i think i just somehow fell into it i saw a tweet and i got connected to the person she was running her own thing she wanted someone to come on board as an early member i just joined it and you know we became partners and it just took off from there then i was a product manager and a digital marketing person at a startup where where i was like employee number 2 then i did my own startup which was the you know the where we raised vc funding 250 employees like, grew really fast like from in 2 years we went from like you know like 5 people to like 250 <laughs> Uh, it three offices across india we were even going to expand out of the country so that was also tech it was a local services marketplace think of it like i don't know what's the canadian equivalent but probably something like thumbtack in the us ngs list uh, so you could hire plumbers electricians carpenters to right. come to your house and do services for you for sure android app will match you with the right experts that are on the platform so it's a simple marketplace supply demand we match these two things I did that for four years. Then I joined another startup where I was a product manager, where I was building a bunch of products. And I quit that in two thousand two thousand nineteen. Two thousand nineteen, you know, traveled for some time and officially launched Copy in June twenty twenty. So it was just kind of. an industry you fell into or interested in, but it's also a good business too. In software, if you can get if you have the right idea. the nature of code allows you to scale pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I what I love about the internet is that your your target market is not restricted to mm-hmm. uh you know your the 5 km catchment area around you know your shop or mm-hmm. your you know your warehouse, right? It's it's the whole this thing. It's a whole in, like you know it's a whole internet. So so I really like that. Yeah, I, you know, I somehow fell into it. I really enjoy it now. I've actually also somehow fell into the HR industry. Hmm. So like I'm one of the few techies now. Like people hate HR work or you know like people <laughs> Yeah, work. for sure. Uh I love it. <laughs> I love it. I like sitting down with people, understanding their problem. Mm-hmm. I like building, you know, solutions to some of these problems. Talking to people. Uh, because when I was a CEO, yeah, talking and you know like kind of helping them figure out, you know, their careers. 
or helping them fit into the company because when i was the ceo you know these were some of the biggest problems that i had software plus hr is a great combo for me right now you can pick that up when you read your blog posts maybe that you are better with people than the average techie the fact that you can write and communicate with people I think uh, kind of comes out in your blog posts. So it's probably a strength for you, I would imagine. Maybe, maybe. I, mean, I never <laughs> thought of it like that, but I guess. One of the cool things about Cappy is that you guys are bootstrapped, no venture capital, and your mm-hmm. kind of plan is to slowly grow it with your own money. And I really like that. And it's kind of an honest way to build a business, it seems, rather than raising a bunch of money and shooting for the moon. Did you guys view it that way? We have designed it that way. I think one lesson I learned last time I raised funds was that once you raise VC funding, you you only have one, two options. You are either a rocket ship, yeah. you either become an Uber, or you are bust. <laughs> yeah. There's no third path. Uh, hmm. You're a failure if there's a third path. What I, I mean, you know, full respect to people like you and you know people who are building slow, sustainable businesses in their communities. Like I'm. Like I went to Japan recently and, you know, so many businesses there, they've been around for like 200 yeah, years. Exactly. And, you know, they take, I mean, they take pride in their craft and the way work is done. And, you know, they still have time for other things in life and pursuing other things instead of, you know, just being a slave to running that business. Uh, it should be the other way around, right? Like the, the business should free you up to do other things. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it should give you some independence and, you know, you should be passionate about it. So, I mean, I'm not against VC money. It's not as if I'm saying that VCs are evil or For sure. don't raise funds. I think you have to apply that formula in the right context mm-hmm. and with the right knowledge. If you don't, then it's a disaster. Right. It comes a point where the VC funding can be a big help and help you grow, but it has to happen at the right time. Yeah. 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 Did you ever read Jason Fried in DHH, The Story of Basecamp? Yeah. A lot. Big fan. Yeah. So one yeah. of the few people who made me quit the VC path. That's cool. I've read those guys' books. I like to read their blog posts and all that. It really obviously reminds me of what you guys are doing. And I figured you'd probably heard of them. (laughs) Yeah, they're big heroes of mine. What's cool is the, I was reading about the daily habit tracking you do. Where did that concept come from? And Mm -hmm. how did you learn how to do that? That book I mentioned a few minutes ago, mm-hmm. uh, Atomic Habits, by this guy called James Clear. Uh, fantastic book, changed my life. I was going through a pretty rough time. Uh, 2018 was, you know, when my dog died, I was pretty much lost at the startup where I had joined, mm-hmm. uh, which was another VC funded startup. Like they raised like $20 million and I was one of the product owners, like a business head wow. inside this thing. But I was pretty lost. I wasn't really happy with what I was doing. Hmm. Uh, and that was a time which was kind of very, it was a turning point for me. But after reading that book uh, and doing the whole habit tracking and stuff, like I lost almost 15, 20 kilos, quit smoking. I've not smoked <laughs> since then, yeah. cigarettes. Went down the path of bootstrapping. You know, my relationships are much healthier now, uh, mentally much more peaceful. So all of these things like literally just came out of that habit tracking thing. I still do it. Like I still Hmm. uh, carry around a habit tracker in my backpack. So it came from there. The book is pretty fantastic. I would recommend everyone should go read that book. Uh, Mm -hmm. It it basically talks about uh, atomic habits. Like you can't in one day be a champion or a skier or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have to break it down into daily consistent practice and how do you do it and how can you design your life Mm -hmm. to have a few signals to do those things, uh, you know, uh, the book can probably explain it way better than I do. The idea is that you do a small daily habit every day or every other day, and it builds up over time instead of trying to take something huge on and overnight and learn mm-hmm. slowly over time or build a habit slowly over time. Yeah, yeah. I think another fantastic quote uh, I keep coming back to from that book is, you don't fall, you don't rise to the level of your goals. Mm-hmm. We all fall to the level of our systems. Right, for sure. Right, so everyone has goals. Like everyone wants to do great things, mm-hmm. but we don't rise to that level. We fall till the level of we, or, you know, we just get to the level of where our systems are. So I think that that book really talks about how the systems of getting to, you know, like bigger things and small steps. 
Have you ever read the systems post with Scott Adams? I think he goes over the fact that his quote is goals are for losers and that it's better to have good systems in place. Uh, this sounds fantastic. Uh, I'll make, I made a note of it. You can look the blog post up too. Yeah, Scott Adams, mm. the, the Dilbert founder, it's that comic strip. His, his point is that systems are more important than specific goals. Sorry. Same thing. Do you read Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett? I want to. I have started getting into personal finance and investment and stuff. Uh, once again, you know, uh, with the way I'm running my life right now, their philosophy really kind of resonates with me. A few things that I did read about the way they talk. One of the things that I really learned was uh, don't spend time doing great things. Right? Don't try to be a genius. Just spend time in avoiding the stupid things. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, that's 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 one thing I really learned. So uh, my time at Kapi just goes now into just answering how will we fail? You know, what will make us go bust? And I just spend time in solving for those. I think I read another blog post of yours and you had, yeah, you were talking about Charlie Munger at some point. I figured that you'd probably read some of his stuff. I think it, yeah. yeah I think it was the $1,000 MRR goal yeah, yeah. blog post. Avoiding the zeros, Naval Ravikant. Have you read much Naval? Yes, um, now and then. I think one of the, my favorite or one of his is that thing around uh, wealth, right? Like the difference between wealth and money. For sure. Fantastic th- Twitter thread uh, and uh, entire podcast on just, you know, what is wealth? How do you make it? Uh, that opened my eyes to, you know, I raised $5 million for my previous startup. On paper, I was worth $12 million, but I wasn't wealthy, man. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> I wasn't making money while I sleep. Um, for sure. Uh, I, maybe had, I maybe had more status, like, People in the ecosystem, you know, were like, were, you know, probably looking up to me because I raised some VC money, but I wasn't wealthy at all. I feel I'm much more wealthy now, even though I'm making only thousand dollars a month. That's very interesting. I guess in a VC back company, the only way, unless you pay yourself a huge salary, the only way to really capture that wealth is if you sell or go or take the IPO route. Yeah. I mean, liquidity is so rare in the VC ecosystem, right? Like mm-hmm. it's baked into the formula, right? Like. The VC knows that, okay, one in hundred will be successful, Mm -hmm. you know, and they're happy with that. You know, they, uh, you know, they make their money work, but unfortunately, if you raise VC money 99 times, you still have Mm -hmm. a great chance of being, uh, you know, uh, being one of those failures. Yeah. Well, that's the uh, mathematics behind the VC formula is they'll get their money out eventually, but your company may not, uh, (laughs) The odds yeah. are your your company yeah. may not. <laughs> yeah. Do you know many other companies or people that are taking the bootstrap route and trying to build their business slow? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I now try and follow as many indie hackers, you know, uh, you know uh, companies of just one or two founders uh, running their business, bootstrap. Uh, yeah, for sure. Getting back to coding, if you were to recommend to somebody how to start, mm-hmm. where would you recommend for them to start on their journey of learning to code? I think before you start buying courses, figure out three or four people whom you can reach out to for personal help. These might be friends. These might be people who you are paying for. There are a few websites where you can pay people to answer your tech questions. I feel that's way more powerful than a course. Uh, and if someone's listening and they do want to start re- learning code and they can't find these five people, you know, just reach out to me. I'll be happy to answer any coding question you might have. After that, the second step should be figure out what do you want to build uh, and a really small version of that. So let's say you want to build, let's say you want to build Facebook. Right, or you want to build a social network. Mm-hmm. Don't go crazy by you know imagining photos and walls and feed and everything like that. Just imagine a really simple version of it and maybe something unique, right? Like, can you build a simpler Facebook or can you just go back and build uh, what was that Facebook thing? Hot or not dot com, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever that built in built in Stanford. I mean, build a much more nicer nicer version. Yeah. Don't go build. Uh, <laughs> sure. Don't go build something that is so sexist. Just figure out something really simple. That's the second step. 
the third one would be breaking it down into smaller steps. So figure out your rough wireframe. Then just literally go into Google and type, okay, if your wireframe has an image in the middle and two buttons at the bottom, right? Just go to Google and type how to insert image into yeah. website. Just as simple as that, right? It'll, within, I can assure you that within five minutes, you will learn how to do that. Mm-hmm. And you'll, you'll think that, oh, wow, this is great. Then you will think, oh, shit, why is this on the left-hand side? Because in HTML, everything floats to the left by default. Mm-hmm. And the next thing you will think is, hey, how do I make it centered? Just literally type that in Google, how to make image centered. And you will learn how to do that. Then you learn about buttons. Then you learn about clicking buttons. Then you learn about, you know, how do I store data? So I would suggest do that. If you're getting stuck somewhere, then think about buying a course. I would suggest don't go into React all the bullshit fancy frameworks out there these are built by engineers to uh, i think to carry forward their their smokes and mirrors and their uh, fancy jargons stay away from all that Uh, stick to javascript and stick to either python ruby or php one of these three backend uh, scripting languages your your choice may also depend on your friends. So if you all your three friends or four friends that you find are all Python people, just go with Python. Don't overthink it, mm-hmm. right? Because they'll be able to teach you faster. That's it. And just repeat this step for three, four months and you'll get there. That's really cool. In terms of books on entrepreneurship or coding and software and that world, do you have any recommendations in that sense? Coding, I really don't know. Uh, I can definitely recommend the JavaScript courses by Wes Boss, W-E-S space, uh, second name, uh, B-O-S. I I can definitely recommend that. Books on entrepreneurship, wow, there are a lot. I'll give you a few of my favorites. It doesn't have to be crazy at work by the Basecamp folks recently. For sure. uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by the folks at uh, this VC firm called Anderson Horowitz. Mm -hmm. That will give you a really deep insight into how crazy the startup life can be. Like, you know, when when, if you're in a rocket ship, you know, how does that look like? I would recommend one of these blogs that I regularly feed, which is fantastic. It's called Fireman Street. He's Canadian. uh, Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. All these Canadian people I'm following, man. (laughs) He's from Ottawa. Um, Yeah. Shane (laughs) Perry. Nice, nice, nice. I actually really like the Canadian, uh, you know, ecosystem also. Like companies like Shopify mm-hmm. are, I think, are a fantastic way to build business, right? And they are a great example of, you know, there's no, you the, the answer is not only bootstrapped or only VC, right? Like apply the right kind of formula at the right time. Exactly. Uh, fantastic business, sustainable business, and still growing like a rocket ship, right? And the company is built in a fantastic way. Uh, I really like the founders. So I really like the, some of these Canadian companies. Another Canadian founder that I follow a lot uh, are the folks from Transistor.fm. What was that one? Transistor.fm. I forgot. I forget the founder's name, but he writes. Uh, he writes some good stuff. Hmm. Yeah, I and mean, this is what comes to my mind. Very cool. I actually, uh, I also have the rework by those guys. Uh, Jason Fried and all. Oh, nice. Yeah. Great book. Well, that's cool. I think that's a really good summary of how you self learned to code, how you started the company you're at now, Capi, what you're reading these days. What advice would you give to another entrepreneur? Maybe that's just starting out. They're in the tech world or their own company in general. I'm, I, I mean, I can only give superlatives uh, <laughs> yeah. um, or little, philosoph- little philosophical advice, but one would be play the long-term game. If you ha- if you are looking at like a five-year horizon or you know a ten-year horizon, it's a, it's a fantastic way to look at things. You will have bad days, uh, but you know they don't count in the long term, and you'll make better decisions that's for sure. The second thing which I think really hurt me when I was running my previous business is not having options. Don't put yourself in a place where, you know, you're really desperate or, uh, you know, you're, you're out of options. Like think to this thing in advance or, you know, take lesser risks so that you don't get there. We all read this, you know, heroic stories of, oh, you know, that startup came from the, you know, they were about to die and they you know, raised money in the last minute or they did this 
change and their you know silicon valley stuff of you know they exploded and now mm-hmm. they're killing it and they did a pivot there's a huge survivorship bias around it and you know we don't get to know the 99% of the things that fails uh, so don't put yourself in a place where you don't have options right like don't put yourself in a place where you will die if you don't raise money mm-hmm. um just just have options it's okay if you go slow but always keep options that's really cool i think that's a great summary of your story so far and where you're at and some of the tools you've learned and everything that's up to this point so thanks a lot mm-hmm. thank you um i i hope I, i know i talked a lot i hope this this is useful awesome well we'll wrap it up there hey thanks for listening everyone hopefully you enjoyed the episode if you liked what you heard check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows You can also find our coffee and chocolate there where we plant one tree for every bag or bar sold through our partnership with One Tree Planted, a cool not-for-profit organization focused on global reforestation. Until next time, happy coffee drinking.